Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to begin the conference this morning. Um, I'd like to extend an informal welcome. We'll hear a formal welcome from the Dutch presidency in a few minutes. Um, my name is Caroline Rees. I'm with the not-for-profit organization SHIFT. Our work is centered around the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. And of course, we're here today for a conference to discuss a potential roadmap for the European Union to take forward the subject of business and human rights over the next five years. Um, I would note at the beginning, this is a, an, a, an event organized by the Dutch Presidency, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs here in the Netherlands, together with MVO Platform, which is a network of NGOs here in the Netherlands focused on corporate social responsibility, the ECCJ, uh, the European Coalition for Corporate Justice, um, and the European Network of National Human Rights Institutions. So many thanks for th to those organizations for giving us the opp opportunity for this conversation today. Now, you will have seen not only the Wi-Fi codes and things like that, but also looping above us here, some instructions on voting. Um, you have the opportunity to vote on a number of statements and ideas this morning, and we hope you'll get very interactive in this way with the issues that we're here to talk about. Um, so please, as those instructions loop, uh, you'll see a couple of statements that we're asking you to give your views on today, and we'll start to see the results of how you uh, respond to those questions coming up on the screens behind us. We're also asking you to tweet, those of you that do such things. So um, it is hashtag um, NL for human rights. Hashtag NL for human rights. Is that correct? No. EU. Sorry. Hashtag EU for human rights. Even bigger. Um, EU for human rights. So please start tweeting. Again, we've got somebody who's going to be gathering up some tweets, and we'll be feeding them up to me here on the platform. Um, we have the makings of a really great conversation here today, and you'll have seen the agenda, a wide array of topics that really slices this cake from very many different directions and gives us the opportunity to dig into the issues. Um, we're looking for a big contribution from you to help us cast a pathway forward. Our focus today, unlike many of these conversations, is around the role of the European Union, uh, the institutions of the EU, and the member states of the EU. So we're really looking, first and foremost today, at the role of government and our collective institutions in helping to advance business and human rights, helping to advance real outcomes on the ground for those individuals who are most exposed to, most vulnerable to, the impacts of business activities. So warmly welcome you um, and invite you to get involved in that discussion and help make this day the success that we need it to be to drive forward our conversation. Um, in a little while, we're going to have some formal uh, introductory remarks from a representative of the, the Dutch government. He's a little bit held up in traffic at the moment, so we're going to just go with the flow because we also have a really important film uh, for you all to see, a film that's been uh, produced by Kim van Haster, uh, supported by the trade union FNV and Fair Food, um, that's really going to ground our conversation here today in what it's really about. Um, those individuals out in the European Union, outside of the boundaries of the European Union, as workers, as communities, um, as other individuals who can be affected by the decisions and actions of business. So to really anchor our conversation today in the realities of what we're talking about, let's start out with a short film. If I can hand over to the organizers to please put the film up for us. and the clothes you wear. Would you be surprised to know that foreign workers making goods for us are often forced to work long hours in unsafe and unethical conditions for little to no pay? Or that in some parts of the world, people are losing access to basic resources like land, food or water because of, amongst others, European companies. And do you expect your government the companies and the shops you buy from to take responsibility for human rights abuses? We 
من قطاع انتاج الطماطم بشكل اللي كان عيشوه دابا بدا في 1986 اللي بداو المقاولات يعني الضيعات الكبرى كتنتج يعني وكتصدر الطماطم هنايا في المنطقه اللي كتمثل النساء فيها 70% تقريبا وهاد اليد العامله جات من مختلف مناطق المغرب سواء في العمل هو كما قلتي الجهد العضلي الجهد العضلي والقوانين ديالنا اللي ما كايناش هذا الشيء اللي هو السوء اللي عندنا في العمل هو ان كنديروا جهد عضلي والقوانين ما كاينينش كانت قاعده في الاجره ديالي 60 درهم في النهار الفلوس ديالي اللي كان ناخذ يلا تيكفيو ليا مع الاولاد عندي مدرسه المصاريف الاكل ديالهم اليومي الطبيب المصاريف مدرسه الاعياد شويه شويه صافي ما تيكفيش داك الشيء ولكن غاديين مع الوقت We know that 91% of the tomatoes exported from Morocco end up in the European Union. That means that if you live here in Europe and you eat tomatoes in winter, there's a high chance that they are from Morocco, often produced under unfair working conditions. <laughs> Vulnerable groups like migrant laborers are victims of business-related human rights abuses every day. This also occurs inside the European Union. In the bouw worden de mensenrechten fors geschonden. De voornaamste groepen die getroffen worden zijn toch wel de voormalige Oost-Europese landen. We hebben te maken met Nederlandse uitzendbureaus die vaak uh, filialen uh, in dit soort landen hebben. Maar we hebben ook te maken met, uh, ja, ik noem het maar ronselaars. Mensen die dus uh, ja, zeg maar in een netwerk zitten en contact opnemen met verschillende mensen met hun specialiteiten in de bouw. En die mensen ronselen dan in het land van herkomst en bieden ze dan bij een uitzendbureau in Nederland aan. Uitzendbureaus hebben daar dus ook hun verdienmodel in gevonden. Hoppa, kan nooit zijn thema iets aan benieuwd zijn, als je eerst ja wordt er wat te zorg de nooit zijn idee salaru, maar niet meer als je wanneer ook op het salaru was dat. Nu ne zicea că nu știu până când trebuie legat podul, fiindcă carul de betonare trebuia desfăcut și trimis înapoi de unde era închiriat. Eu eram pus acolo ca să conduc și zicea către mine că să-i mân pe băieți, să-i zic să lucrui mai repede, dar pur și simplu băieții nu mai puteau, că erau deja, și mai ales în pod unde era locul prea mic, deja nu mai puteau de picioare, de una alta, că... Era tare în asol să lucri și cu viteză, că erau obosiți, pur și simplu, oamenii erau rupți. Asta a fost ce mai. Și el încă zicea că, încă atunci zicea că, fă o fericit, că te fac și eu fericit. Deze mensen die, uh, ja, die worden extra onder druk gezet en die werken dus soms zeven dagen per week en twaalf uur per dag of meer. En als ze weigeren hier aan mee te doen, uh, ja, dan worden ze naar huis gestuurd. Fost oameni foarte foarte bun, cu care am lucrat împreună. Trebuia să te gândești că fiecare avem pentru a avea familie și fiecare care avem pentru ceva, și nu ca să slugărească în altă țară. En dan als ze thuis zijn, krijgen ze de mededeling, je hoeft niet terug te komen. En die mensen die komen vaak ook bij andere uitzendbureaus niet aan de bak. Dus met andere woorden, er wordt op de een of andere manier onderling gecommuniceerd over uh, over personen en die worden dan als lastig beschouwd. Se mi s-au acumulat ceva ore, vreau să am avut bani de vacanță, ceva și... Astea două săptămâni m-am blocat de spate. După aia am intrat în concediu medical de la 1 noiembrie până la sfârșit. Nu am mai avut nicio legătură cu, cu firma.
European governments and corporations are also linked to human rights abuses outside Europe. In many countries, victims of abuses are powerless. They can't achieve justice or obtain remedy. They face many obstacles and a lack of assistance, cooperation and protection from their own governments. Bueno, este río tiene una importancia ancestral, espiritual, porque en ello vive el espíritu femenino desde la cosmovisión del pueblo lenca. Este río Hualcarque sirve para la alimentación, que hay plantas medicinales y yo creo que significa vida. La historia comienza con el golpe de estado en Honduras en el año 2009 cuando el Congreso Nacional hace una cantidad muy importante de concesiones para proyectos hidroeléctricos y proyectos mineros. Entre ellos se encontraba una concesión del río Hualcarque, que está justo al lado de la comunidad de Río Blanco. Entonces comienza la construcción desde el año 2010, eh, pero en el año 2013 la comunidad de Río Blanco, organizada el Copín, comienza un proceso de resistencia en oposición al proyecto hidroeléctrico. una violación desde el comienzo. Es una concesión que no tuvo un proceso de consulta libre previo informada. No es un crimen defender nuestros propios derechos como pueblos indígenas. Han suscitado muchos casos de, de violencia y asesinato a la gente que se oponía al proyecto, ya que este eh, tenía contratados seguridad privada pero también eh, tenían alianzas con las fuerzas represivas del Estado hondureño, como lo son la Policía Nacional, la Policía Militar y fuerzas especializadas que resguardaban el plantel de la empresa. El gobierno de Honduras y las empresas habían levantado una campaña muy fuerte de hostigamiento, de amenazas a su vida, pero también de criminalización a la lucha de ella y a la lucha del COPIN. Ella hizo públicas 33 amenazas estas eran del conocimiento del Estado de Honduras que no hizo nada para protegerla. Lo que nosotros sabemos es que el 2 de marzo ella fue asesinada de manera violenta por balas en un clásico asesinato de sicarios. Responsabilizamos al Estado de Honduras por haber actuado siempre en alianza las empresas extractivas en contra de los derechos de los pueblos indígenas, pero también por no haber garantizado la seguridad de mi madre, que era responsabilidad de ellos y ellas. Parte de nuestros objetivos de esta gira en Europa es denunciar a los bancos europeos que participan, que tienen inversiones en estos proyectos que supuestamente generan energías limpias. Lo que estamos pidiendo es una suspensión definitiva de sus fondos. También nosotros nos sentimos fuertes y creemos que eh, con su asesinato pues ahora tenemos más fuerza y más energía y más convicción de que estos proyectos no pueden seguir construyéndose. Ladies and gentlemen, here to give you a formal welcome on behalf of the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs is Martin Vandenberg, the Director General for Foreign Economic Relations. Thank you uh, very much, and I think this uh, film illustrates how important it is that we discuss the topic uh, of today. And as was just said, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I warmly welcome you to the official premises of the Dutch Presidency of the European Union. But before I go any further, I would like to introduce you our Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs, Brett Koenders, 
unfortunately he is uh, he was not is not able to join us in in person today but who will address you with a video message also on behalf of uh, our Minister of Foreign Trade and Development Corporation, uh, Lillian Plume. Cáceres, in her home. Berta was a tireless defender of indigenous people's rights, even when those rights sometimes clashed with business activities in her community. Protecting human rights defenders is one of the cornerstone of the Dutch human rights policies. It's unacceptable that so many people live in fear of their livelihoods, of their lives, of even their families' lives, because they are standing up for their rights. Worldwide, civil society is being suffocated. NGOs are increasingly under threat, including some that are fighting against business-related human rights abuse. That's why I'm so proud that we are organizing this conference together with civil society. And I'm happy that businesses come out in force to make this a true multi-stakeholder event. We have to work together with all stakeholders to prevent human rights abuse. And when it does take place, victims need access to remedy. The Netherlands would like the EU to lead by example. Today, we want to explore how the European Union can fulfill this role. Between government, business and civil society, we may not always agree. But at least we can have an open and free exchange of views. We should cherish this, precisely because it's the one thing that Barta Cáceres could not have. Today we are marking the fifth anniversary and almost a day of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. And before the guiding principles, many uh, businesses either did not realize the impact they had on human rights or rejected the notion that they had anything to do with human rights altogether. So happily, those days are gone. Last year, a study conducted by the Economist Intelligence Unit showed that 83% of the surveyed businesses acknowledged the important role of business in respecting human rights. And Minister Kunas made it quite clear, human rights constitu constitute one of the three pillars of foreign policy of the Netherlands, security, prosperity, and freedom. And business and human rights in the area where prosperity and freedom come together. And we strongly reject the notion that economic success for a Dutch company should come at the expense of human rights. It's not sustainable development when profits in one place contribute to suffering in another. And that is why human rights are also an important part of our foreign trade and development agenda. And Minister Plumen has made responsible business conduct one of the touchstones of her tenure. In this area, we have developed a truly Dutch approach involving all stakeholders. And we are working on international CSR governance with more than 10, in more than 10 high-risk sectors. And these governance are agreements between business, civil society, and government. And this is a crucial part of the approach. Only when we talk with and not about all stakeholders can we achieve true progress which is why I'm also very happy with the balanced composition of today's participants. And the CSR confidence will leverage the collective influence of all stakeholders to make global value change more sustainable. And this includes, of course, the ambitions, ambitions to make sure Dutch corporations do not cause or contribute to human rights abuse. To illustrate the approach, you will hear more about the Dutch Garment Covenant later today. And at the same time, we should recognize that this may not be enough, that I'm convinced that Dutch companies want to avoid abusing human rights at all costs. But even with the best intentions in the world, things can always go wrong. And when they do, victims of business-related human rights abuse need and deserve 
access to remedy. And this is why we commissioned an in-depth study into the avenues available to such victims to hold Dutch companies liable in court, even when the abuse took place outside the Netherlands. And based on this study, we recently announced several measures to strengthen access to remedy in the Netherlands. And these measures relate to, among others, access to evidence and collective redress. And these elements, the multi-stakeholder approach on the preventive side and access to justice on the remedy sides are complementary. And we are convinced that this two-pronged approach is also the way to go for the EU as a whole. And five years after the adoption, adoption of the UN guiding principles, the EU has come a long way. But more effort is needed. If, as Minister Kuna said, we want to lead by example. And that is why we are hosting this conference today during the Dutch EU presidency. And so today we will explore how the EU can build on its international leadership role when it comes to business and human rights. And I wish you all a lot of wisdom, good discussions, and I will look forward to hearing from your conclusions. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I'm going to invite our panelists to come up to the stage at this point and uh, take a seat here in the front, so please do come along up. Um, we've seen a film that sets out some extraordinary and yet at the same time all too ordinary realities from uh, both within the European Union and well beyond the borders of the European Union. And we've heard a, a statement from um, the Minister of Foreign Affairs um, and from Martin van der Berg about the um, commitment and the leadership of the Dutch government around these issues um, and through them then a call also to the EU more widely to continue to take up this banner and lead the discussion forwards. And the task now turns to all of us uh, to provide some inputs, some ideas, some stimulation, some inspiration to what that agenda should be. So I'm pleased to have a fantastic panel here on stage with me. Before I introduce them, let me just uh, reiterate that you'll see up on the slides above us um, another opportunity for some voting, and you can see some statements there. Certain statements, certain propositions of what the EU could do uh, to take forward parts of this agenda. Um, so please follow the instructions, uh, get voting, um, and we'll see some results coming up. What we're asking you to vote on is which of these approaches do you think could have the single greatest impact for progress? And of course, if you have ideas you're not seeing up here, then please tweet them, and I'll get it right this time, hashtag eu for human rights uh, Tweet any additional ideas that you may have to hashtag eu um, for human rights and we'll pick up those tweets as we go through the morning and the day. So to introduce our panel, I'm delighted to have here Stavros Lambrinidis, the EU Special Representative for Human Rights, Dante Pesce, the Chair of the United Nations Working Group on Business and Human Rights, Linda Cromion, the Secretary General of the International Organization of Employers, and Jeff Vogt, the Legal Director from the International Trade Union Confederation. So welcome to all of you. And Stavros, let me perhaps start with you, if I may. Um, We've got some ideas up on these slides of different courses of action that could be taken, not exclusive of each other. Um, we heard of some of the, the calls to action that are needed to improve the realities on the ground. Uh, coming from the perspective of the European Union, which is what we're here to talk about today, what do you see as the top priority? I would say <coughs> all of these proposed priorities underline one fundamental fact that the UN guiding principles, uh, as remarkable as they were in achieving them, the first international document uh, that has everyone's agreement on it, are not legally binding. So it is the EU's obligation, uh, in, uh, in my view and in the EU's view, to put teeth to those guiding principles. Teeth does not always mean legally binding instru instruments or, or laws or regulations, but it means also that. And it also means other non-legal but effective ways to promote them. So, first thing, to get those teeth 
going even more effectively, we need to have an action plan, a new one, a relaunch of the EU's leadership. And this is precisely what Commissioner Bjankowska at the European Commission is doing as we speak, having an action plan for the precise implementation of the guiding principles. The second thing we need to do is to take what we already have on the books, such as the so-called Barnet Directive, a major EU achievement uh, in leadership, requiring big EU companies all over the world, no matter where they are, to submit non-financial reporting every year on what they are doing on human rights, on women's rights, on environment, etc. But make sure that this works, because the danger with that uh, is that it could become a ticking box exercise, a PR exercise for companies. Now, we must make sure, first of all, that we as European Union have a collective way to instruct companies on how it is that they should do this reporting to be meaningful. And secondly, I think we should be supporting civil society in Europe to make sure that they are able, they have the resources, finances and people, to review every one of those financial reports and to keep the companies and the EU's feet on the coal. Uh, I would very briefly, because I know that our time is limited, also mention that we need to focus on remedies both remedies in the EU, but also remedies outside. There's a big discussion about having a legally binding instrument on business and human rights or not. But what I have done in virtually every meeting I've had and every visit in countries around the world who some of them support a legally binding instrument, others don't, is tell them why is it that instead of having this politicized debate, we're not ensuring that in your country, as in ours, we at least have the laws in place to make sure we punish those companies who violate human rights. And in most cases, I don't get much of an answer other than, okay, yes, that makes sense. And then the EU has a responsibility, that's the fourth priority, to be there to export its own expertise and support those governments. We should put our money where our mouth is and make sure that laws are in place in every country around the world for remedies. Uh, finally, we need to educate more companies and our publics. Unfortunately, five years after the UNDPs are in place, and I am sure that you will be able to confirm this, we have a remarkable amount of work by the working group, a remarkable amount of work by the international community. But many of our companies still don't understand what this is. Business and human rights is not corporate social responsibility in the traditional sense of the word. We must understand this. Companies, I was in, in uh, Brazil recently, we had a major EU-funded a conference together with the Brazilian government on this. Companies seem to think that if they build a school next to where they have a project that pollutes a, a river, that that is okay, that does it, it doesn't. Business and human rights is not about how you use the money you make, it is about how you make your money. And to manage to educate our companies and our public so that this doesn't just become a theoretical exercise, but one that companies understand can also affect positively both their credibility, their image, and their bottom line is something that we, I hope, can relaunch. And thank you to the Dutch presidency. Congratulations for taking this initiative. Stavros, thank you. Linda, so we've heard ideas. Companies need to learn more about this, understand more about this, be educated more about this set of issues. We need to see more action where abuses do occur to provide remedy. Uh, tell us a bit about your perspective about the priorities you see for the way forward. I've got a bit of a different perspective here than the previous uh, speaker. Uh, coming from the business and also looking into the movie and everything that has been shown there, of course, is very sad and shouldn't happen. But there is a few remarks I would like to make around the movie. First of all, the movie doesn't go into the root cause of, of the cases. In the example that has been given about this large infrastructure project, for instance, this dam was ordered by the government to be built. So I would say it's good that governments talk about business getting their act in order, but also governments should really take the position of getting their house in order first. And the EU wants to lead, and I think that's a great ambition, but within the EU, with all due respect, there is many countries who still have not had the national action plans in place, which is the recommendation as a result of the end guiding principles, where it starts with the state duty to protect, and national action plans are the way to go. I know it's there in the Netherlands, I know it's there in the UK, there's a few other examples, there's more on the way, but there's still a lot to be done. And then we're only talking here about the EU, we're not even talking about outside of the EU, 
where there was even less national action plans or even less action to take place there. So I think we should start first there in setting the rules and regulations in place before we move to the next step. The other thing I want to make a comment around is really about the business and its role there. And I really echo the words of Martin van der Berg, who said that business has taken its responsibility. And if I look into the movie, I think it's not that balanced. I think we should also show that part of the picture, what already happened. If I think back six, seven years ago, uh, and I'm coming from private sector, uh, when I first addressed business and human rights within a company I worked for, the first re re response I got from investor relations, someone said, Linda, business and human rights is not of interest to our investors. That has changed. That response you would never, ever get again anymore at, in business at this point in time. Business is accepting that business and human rights is something other than CSR. It's indeed not only what you do, but how you do it. And that has a, it's a holistic and inclusive approach about uh, a business within, within society. But we have to be a bit more proud about what we already have achieved in the last uh, five years. So if I would need to say, what is it that we need to focus on? The first thing is really get our national action plans in each and every country in place. That is what I would expect to do. I really appreciate that the uh, uh, EU is taking the lead in that one, but it also should take a look internally within the own states as part of Europe. And the second uh, thing that I think is crucial here is that what we see happening is that business and human rights has been accepted and understood but still learning, it's a journey. We will, not, uh, you know, we will not change the world tomorrow or in five years by the big companies, the M&Es. The smaller companies, that is an issue. So the question I would have is what can we do together to really approach those small and medium enterprises to make sure they understand, to make sure that they understand the role they play and within their own responsibility with the tools that are simple, that are understandable, that they also start working on this topic. And I will pause here now. Thank you. Well, um, Jeff, Linda's expanded the set of issues on the table for us further with ideas around national action plans, small and medium enterprises. Trade union perspective, how do you see this? Well, looking at the video, um, you know, the first uh, two segments, and I would include the third, uh, really have to uh, focus on the question of uh, collective organization, collective power. And, you know, over nearly a century ago, the ILO was established to ad address exactly this issue. And uh, then it was decided, obviously, that freedom of association and collective bargaining were ways to uh, ensure uh, that workers had a way uh, in which to assert their rights collectively and that, that through collective bargaining they could address uh, a number of issues, obviously with a, a legal framework uh, in which that is embedded to make sure that those rights are respected. And we saw in the video that, obviously, there's um, in the in the countries profiled a, a real absence of rights and, um, and an absence of remedy. Uh, and that those words were uh, spoken uh, directly uh, in the first case of Morocco. Um, so yes, I think access to remedy is uh, uh, very important and it's uh, kind of the pillar that I think that unfortunately gets uh, the least amount of discussion at this point. Um, you know, I'm very happy to hear uh, from uh, Savros his, uh, his uh, comments about uh, uh, needing to put uh, teeth into this, and uh, I'd be very happy to see uh, the EU to pursue that. Um, you know, we uh, ourselves have uh, undertaken some research on um, the legal systems in uh, a number of countries and whether they do provide uh, or can provide access to remedies for violations that happen in their subsidiaries or suppliers. And we're finding that, it, as is no surprise, there are a number of substantial legal obstacles that uh, prevent workers who have little access to justice in their own countries to pursue it uh, elsewhere. Um, so I think this is an area that requires, I think, much more uh, discussion uh, and action. Uh, and so I'm pleased to hear that there's um, there's an interest on that. Um, uh, and obviously important for us is the upcoming discussion uh, at the International Labour Organization in June around uh, global supply chains. Uh, and this is an area uh, where um, we uh, are you know, pushing, want to push the discussion ahead. 
Uh, there's obviously the discussion now uh, at the UN around the, the Biden Treaty on the Business and Human Rights, but I think uh, particularly with regard to uh, labor, uh, the, the human rights of workers, uh, that um, we hope to make progress on this issue uh, around issues of uh, human rights due diligence, transparency and accountability in that forum. Thank you, and in raising that issue also of supply chains, you connect with a number of other dynamics. We've seen the G7's commitment to take that forward. It's, it's certainly, I mean, the ILO, the, the, the process that will happen there is so critically important. So, so Dante, I mean, as we pull the lens back to that, that, that broader international stage and the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights and its role in this, tell us a bit about how you see the priorities, if you would. Well, a, f a few... It's okay. A few, a few um, uh, reactions. Well, the first thing is to uh, thank uh, the Dutch presidency and the EU for the invitation. This is the, actually the single celebration of the five years of the guiding principles. So it's, uh, let's say, it's, uh, it's an honor to be here. And, um, and me not being European, I would like to uh, add a fifth uh, component to the questions, which is the role of Europe beyond Europe. And um, so this is, uh, these questions are very, are, are okay, I have no problem with them, but are very much uh, European-centric. And I'll say that uh, our forum for November this year is on leadership and leverage. And I will say uh, Europe and the European countries uh, that are more advanced in their understanding of business and human rights should lead, and that will be a normal expectation, and it's our expectation, but also use your leverage more actively and with much, much more ambition. Um, we cannot feel happy to have this full, this room more or less full, uh, because this is a room where everyone is more or less converted and is in the same, uh, let's say, uh, we are in the same, uh, uh, you know, um, train, I guess, um, but beyond us, there are so many other uh, players that are not in the room and that we have not been able to reach to them uh, effectively. Uh, and I will say that regarding governments and, and pillar one and the, and the state duty to protect and to also lead by example, I like very much that wording from G7 that has been used today and more and more, uh, the lead by example is something absolutely needed. Uh, of course, in Europe, uh, there is some progress and significant progress in national action plans and some other uh, countries are on their way, but beyond Europe, there's only one action plan. And, and to be frank, uh, uh, we don't see that much government standing and leading by example. And that also opens one door, which is all the economic activities under the control of the states, which are principles four, five, six, uh, state-owned enterprises, public procurement, uh, sovereign wealth funds. And, and, and what we are seeing is that governments don't need a sophisticated, uh, national action plan as sort of a standalone one to demonstrate uh, political will and, 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 and this ambition to actually lead by example. You just need to have an ownership policy and, term, and tell uh, the, the directors of state-owned enterprises that uh, human rights is not negotiable and, and do it. Yeah, so that's one, and put it in practice and set your policies, etc. And that would be a very, very practical thing to do and, and is something uh, that is not yet there. Uh, the, other, the other thing is that uh, from our perspective also that, that putting more teeth to what is already there is something that is that will be very welcome. Um, for example, you, you have published in Europe uh, the trade, uh, trade for all uh, policy framework or, or uh, communication uh, last October. And that's something that is extremely important because for most part of the developing countries are, are, are somehow desperate to attract investments and to push exports into Europe and other uh, developed economies. And since uh, the trade for all already talks about and explicitly cites uh, the guiding principles, it's another opportunity to actually uh, use your leverage in an active way and to get um, more countries on board. We have a, a long way to go, but I, I think the Europe beyond Europe uh, is a no-brainer from my point of view, and actually being ambitious and making and calling you to be ambitious uh, and to work in, in coalitions all over the world, not only in Europe, it will be something extremely important, needed, and, and, and of course, that's the, let's say, the main vision for the future. 
Dante, thank you. And Linda, I'd like to come back to you, if I may, and follow up on this. We've heard a lot about you know, teeth and putting teeth into things. I've got a couple of tweets that have been coming through here. One was uh, about the, the European Commission should push the European Investment Bank to introduce human rights assessments and reporting for its projects. Right. One around access to remedy. Um, how do we ensure that European corporations are accountable where abuses uh, are committed. Um, and we're seeing a number of, of things come through in this line around due diligence as well and in relation to supply chains. Um, tell us a bit about how you see this. The, the, the conversation about putting teeth into things is not always a comfortable yeah. one for, for companies. So uh, what would you say about that? Yeah, and I think it's also coming back to what uh, Jeff said earlier. The supply chain discussion and the due diligence around it is it, a difficult topic. Um, and, and sometimes I feel that the supply chain discussion, you know, is being sketched in a very simple way and by doing so ignoring the reality. Supply chain is not, say, a linear relationship. Uh, it's, it's very diffuse, it's massive, it's, number of, it's big number of suppliers. Uh, um, I think also the illusion that one can control its entire supply chain uh, is, not, is not true. Uh, also the illusion that if you have your multinationals, uh, uh, if you have a process with them in place and then you have solved everything, that's an illusion too. Multinationals only account for 20% of the global workforce, 80% is not in MEs. There is a lot of due diligence uh, that is not in the global supply chain, but in regional and local supply chain. So I think we have to be very careful about what can we achieve. And I think each and every company in the supply chain has its own responsibility as well that we should not, uh, not ignore. Are companies focusing more on it? Yes. And rightly so, and we have seen examples in the movie. There is many other examples that you probably are very much familiar with. Give the example of forced labor in Thai uh, fishing uh, uh, industry uh, and how to tackle that one. But it's also very clear that those issues cannot be solved in isolation, nor can they be solved by one specific uh, on individual company. That requires sectoral uh, collaboration. That requires the governments uh, working together. That requires the stakeholders working together in finding these solutions, putting the burden only on companies to solve, for example, the Thai fishing industry and forced labor. That is, is not the way forward. And it's also not going to lead to any effective solution and remedy. Mm. Uh, Jeff, pick up on this as well. You mentioned supply chains yourself um, and, of course, the ILO conference coming up. Um, what do we really need to see happen around this? What, we've got complexity, as Linda has said. Not everything is controlled. What, what needs to happen? Well, if I can briefly respond to that, though. I mean, the, the point that, uh, you know, we just simply can't control our supply chains, I don't know why that is uh, an acceptable statement to, to make. It's, um, yes, I mean, I think uh, businesses need to control their supply chains, and that's part of the problem, uh, is that they are not. And I think what we see, and I know what we see, looking at uh, uh, you know my own professional experiences, is you know we have a number of companies, not necessarily EU, around the world, uh, that make sourcing decisions often based on uh, low regulatory environments, uh, low wages, uh, and uh, these are often uh, countries uh, that companies know well ahead of time. Uh, do not enforce labor laws uh, and, uh, and and benefit uh, substantially from uh, poor enforcement and low wages. So, in making consciously making that decision and and then moving uh, production when wages may creep up in one country and shift over to another to another lowly regulated environment, it is perpetuating the problem. So, I think companies uh, own. Uh, sourcing to obviously uh, sourcing policies contribute uh, to the violations that we do see uh, happening uh, in the supply chain. So I think it's absolutely, it is the responsibility of companies to know what their supply chains look like uh, and, and uh, have uh, some control over that. Um, I mean, that's UN guiding principles are very clear on that responsibility. Um, so uh, in the Iowa discussion, um, this is a general discussion. Uh, he'll be the first. Uh, but it is the ambition of the ITUC that we, uh, in the in near future, move towards a, a standard setting on this. I think we we do need to take a look at the um, not only the fundamental rights but the broader uh, international labor standards system. 
uh, which I think was conceived in a time where much of that was applied to workers and employers in a direct employment relationship in a single jurisdiction, and that is no longer the case. We have production happening uh, worldwide with workers in a variety of employment relationships, and the ILO uh, standards and supervisory system needs to be adjusted to take uh, into account that reality, and I think that's what we want to get out of the, the Great. discussion. Well, I mean, uh, this conversation about supply chains is going to feed yeah. forward, so thank you for uh, laying the seeds for a good discussion um, around that. Dante, um, let me come back to you. So we are, as we heard, five years on from the um, endorsement of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. Um, where do you see, at, at, at the broader level, where do you think we, we need to take this? What role do the guiding principles have in this conversation? Are they, um, are they at the centre of it, or are they one amongst many things? What, how should we be using them? Well, the, 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 let's say, um, from the half uh, full side of the glass, uh, the guiding principles are not disputed, are integrated, oh. in, uh, and that's a very important thing because we're using the same language and the same understanding, business, governments, and civil society overall. There might be, of course, uh, certain uh, groups that not, might not like the uptake or the speed, of course, and I'm, I'm one of them, probably, that I'm not satisfied with, the, with our, our own ambition, but nevertheless, it's a very good, very, very good that we use the same language and it's not disputed. Then, in terms of uh, the, the, what, what should happen next, is to move much more into implementation. I think we have a good understanding at the high level, political commitments of governments and big business and the associations. But then when we scratch into the practices, uh, the practices are far from good. And, and we're still on a pioneer level. Governments, nine, ten governments that are the pioneers, regions, the EU as a pioneer region, some big companies, some associations, but still all of it in a pioneer level. And we need to speed up and scale up from the pioneers or whatever we are into a much more ambitious uh, agenda uh, in order to reach some real critical mass. Now we have critical mass at certain level in certain forums and certain levels, but it's actually not all over the world. And if, you, if we have this same forum out of Europe, uh, the composition of the room would, have, would be very different because um, we don't have action plans. Uh, governments actually shy from showing up into events like this. Uh, there are all the time very good excuses for not showing up. And just an indication, in in our annual forum last year, uh, not only governments, actually big business and uh, associations as well, for my region, Latin America, we could not find one speaker uh, from any company uh, owned by Latin Americans or by state-owned uh, or, or state companies in all the region. We only found two or three from Africa and Asia. Uh, and then from governments, uh, we had 140 or so uh, delegations or government rep uh, governments represented in the forum, but only 10 governments had people from capital. And uh, so basically the diplomats were all there, and, uh, but then when you need to talk and have a real discussion with the people that have the mandate to implement things in reality, and that talk to business or have control on state-owned enterprises or set the real policies regarding trade agreements or uh, economic, uh, uh, the economic the development agenda, uh, they're just not there yet in the room. Uh, there might be around uh, Europe, yes, and I'll, and I'll say that from out of Europe uh, we look with admiration of what you have done here in order to be able to create, for example, platforms for uh, peer learning that we don't have out of Europe and, and platforms to basically incentivize a race to the top. Um, that's something that is uh, extremely needed because there are uh, political uh, bodies out of Europe, of course, and development banks, etc., but they are not there. Just an example, I have engaged uh, already four times with the presidency of the Inter-American Development Bank asking them why you, don't, uh, you haven't got the business and human rights on board. And they said, our assembly of governors, which are the shareholders, the governments, none have ever asked us to do so. So if our own governments that own the bank don't ask the, the leadership of the bank to do something practical, then of course the people that work in the bank, even if they are, let's say, believers, and they say, well, this might be a good idea, they just don't do it because they don't make those uh, kind of political uh, decision. And, and one, uh, and one uh, little final comment uh, is, uh, we, we would like to see uh, may, uh, everyone that is on this journey, let's say, show progress 
and make each, each other accountable to everyone else. So if your starting point is very low, let's say you're an entry point, well, show progress and gradually you will get there. And, 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 and we would like to ask business that have already engaged, governments that have already engaged, show pro If you have an action plan already published, show progress on the implementation. If you don't have it published, so then show progress in how you're getting there. And, and if you actually uh, talk about uh, leading by example, well, do it, yeah? Do it and show the evidence that uh, something is happening in the ground, and we will be very happy to uh, show that and to uh, recognize that effort and, and probably generate the conditions and the platforms for incentivizing each of uh, and, and each other uh, in this logic of racing to the top instead of racing to the bottom, which is still more or less the case in most part of business activities, but I'll, I'll have to say also in most part of government activities. Mm -hmm. uh, racing to the bottom to say we are a very uh, friendly country for foreign direct investments, uh, which implies that we don't ask anything and we don't even collect taxes and you're very free to come in and do whatever you want. That's also a failure of our own states, yeah, or some of our states. Um, so race to the bottom is what I'll say is uh, more or less the case around the world, and we need to uh, generate conditions for ra racing to the top. Dante has spoken eloquently there about the need to see leadership also beyond the borders of the European Union, and I saw one tweet coming through saying, yes, what do we tell the citizens of weak states around the world, and we see that, that need. Um, close us out, Stavros, if you would, Either that leadership and projecting that leadership from the European Union. Um, how can we get to that ambitious leverage idea that we heard about? Excellent. Well, <clears throat> some of you may not know. <clears throat> European Union Special Representative for Human Rights does not mean for human rights in the EU. My job is to do our human rights foreign policy around the world. But the fact of the matter is, I'm here focusing also on what happens in the EU because those two things are very difficult to separate. Our credibility in promoting human rights around the world relies dramatically on our ability to demonstrate that we are good at doing it internally. And therefore, Part of my emphasis on the priorities has been on what we should do more internally, uh, but of course my real job is what we're doing on it externally. First thing I want to mention about the UNDPs in the future. I'm very pleased about the fact that in the EU we are united on this, and when I say we're united in the EU, it's not an easy deal. 28 member states, a European Parliament, an external action service, a European Commission with 28 commissioners, uh, it's just not easy. But look at, I see my friend Richard Howard here. Richard is from the European Parliament, a leader for years now in the business human rights debate. Uh, the European Parliament is a force behind this. Look at the external action service of, the, of our ministry. I personally, and so many in our human rights dialogues around the world with 140 countries, so many of us, every time we visit, raise business human rights as a fundamental topic. In Brazil recently, we organized with the Brazilian government, they were there at the highest level, a business and human rights discussion. In South Africa, the same. We supported the African Union on the first EU human rights discussion on how to implement national action plans in African Union states, which we have committed to provide support for. Same thing goes for CELAC. Same thing goes for the ASEAN in Asia. Uh, with Japan, and other countries, we are in contact to be able to export a positive a key, if you like. Second thing I would mention, you're absolutely right, Linda, and I think that's one of the big successes of the UNGPs. They have managed to change the debate. A few years back, your stakeholders would tell you, don't talk to me about this. Today, no one tells you this anymore. Mm -hmm. And I have seen positive examples of European business around the world. I was in a country, no point of mention which one, and I was talking to the big industry leaders in a particular industry. And the reason I was doing this is because I figured that maybe they would be more persuasive in talking to their government uh, to become more human rights friendly than perhaps I would be from the outside, given how they are particularly interested in ensuring that they could export things to Europe with low or no tariffs. And that industry told me that there were European um, uh, procurers of what they were producing who had been forcing them for years to change the practices, mm -hmm. up to a point even of now requiring them to have special cash machines that their workers would insert a card and get their salary so that the mother company could check and make sure that they were getting the adequate salary that, that they were promised to get. 
So European business can be a major force for good and has been, but also it can be, as the documentary showed, and not just European business, a source for not good. And this is a battle we're giving around the world as well. We want to make sure that the debate is not politicized. It's okay to talk about multinationals, but, but, but correctly, Linda said again, multinationals can be a major problem or a force for good, but the vast majority of workers around the world today are hired and abused by domestic companies, not by multinationals. And it is an important, in my view, focus of the international community to look at that. Linda, if I would just say one more thing on this. There are more to say, but just one more thing. We have another obligation in the EU, we feel it very strongly, we apply it around the world. And that is to ensure that human rights defenders dealing with economic social rights, including land grabbings and other issues, have the full EU support in their work. Whether it is a political umbrella we offer, or whether it is financial help, or whether it is ensuring that we work with the governments to have mechanisms in place to protect them against those who attack them and sometimes kill them including mechanisms of redress. In the majority of my visits in a number of countries that Dante has, or regions Dante mentioned as well, my focus is precisely on that. Finally, is UNDP something alone or something that can be integrated in many other things? It, it can and should. Sustainable development goals, Agenda 2030 at the United Nations. For us, for the European Union, that is a major focus and a major importance. And companies and the UNGPs themselves and their philosophies should come in there. Dear friends, you can develop by violating human rights. You can have no environmental laws. You can have virtually no labor laws. You can produce things very cheaply, perhaps, in that way. But is that the kind of development that the world should be looking forward to? I mean, is that really sustainable development? What should Europe's role be in that particular world. I submit to you, Europe should and does fight for development based on quality, not inequality. Quality of the environment, quality of labor rights, quality of education, quality of human rights, because that is what, in the end of the day, is going to give you sustainability. Inequality is going to bring everything down. I absolutely agree, no race to the bottom. I absolutely agree, all stakeholders, NGOs, companies, governments have responsibilities. Governments, however, are the only ones who have the responsibility to protect. And this is the kind of responsibility the EU is taking very seriously. Stavros, thank you for rounding us out with that real call to action. Um, we've heard a, a number of themes coming from our panelists this morning, putting teeth into the guiding principles and their implementation, access to remedy coming through, need to tackle the legal obstacles, the importance of national action plans and projecting this from the state duty to protect um, through appropriate rules and regulations and showing progress where you are and, and, and how you are moving forward against that. Um, this ambitious leverage idea within and beyond the borders of the European Union, the need to build capacity, not least amongst smaller companies and get control of supply chains and better insight into uh, what's happening there and ability to use leverage through purchasing practices of government and of business in this space and, of course, that support to those who defend human rights uh, around the world. You'll also have seen come up your responses to at least the four statements that we had for you um, and uh, a fairly even distribution amongst A, B and D as, as issues that you see as priorities amongst those four. So thank you for voting on that. Thank you for your tweets as we've gone through, and we've been keeping track of, of all of those as well. And your discussions are going to continue through this morning, through this afternoon, to dig into all of these themes and really help us come out with some uh, recommendations that can go to the European Union as to how to take this forward, not just at a policy rhetorical level, but in that really hard-nosed action, practical, workable action uh, within and beyond beyond uh, the member states of this European Union. Um, in a moment, I'll say a word about our logistics for the parallel sessions, but first of all, can I invite you to uh, say thank you to our panelists.
So we'll have a slide going up now. You will see the six parallel sessions. For those of you who have not picked up your note at the registration desk that says which sessions you signed for, please do do that if you're in any doubt as to what session you're going to be in. So please do go and check that out. Um, you'll see the different names of the rooms here. Three of them are on this floor. They are Targ, Donau, and Sava. Targ, Donau, and Sava are on this floor. Uh, the other three are upstairs, and to get upstairs, you go uh, back into the corridor at the end of uh, the, the, this, this section you came along here, turn right, go to the very end and turn right. There are some stairs up there, so exit this corridor, turn right, go to the very end, turn right, and you'll go upstairs, and there you'll find the other three rooms for the next sessions. I would encourage you to move there swiftly, because those sessions are due to start in just 10, 15 minutes, so please do get to those rooms, and then we'll have a chance for coffee after that. Thank you.